Hey everybody, welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. Uh, so the quick agenda is I'm gonna do a brief introduction um, and then Sam Bale will do her talk and then we will have Q&A at the end, but feel free to put any questions in either the chat or the Q&A tab and um, we'll um, you know, aim to get those all answered. A little bit about Data Umbrella. Uh, we are an inclusive community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are volunteer run. Uh, about me, I'm a statistician and data scientist. I have a master's in statistics and an MBA in business analytics and technology, and I am on uh, social media platforms, Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub with handle at Reshma S. So feel free to follow me um, there if you would like. Uh, I'm going to go over some um, housekeeping. Uh, we have a code of conduct. Um, our goal is to provide an uh, inclusive community, and so we aim to provide harassment-free experience for everyone, be kind to others, and thank you for, you know, contributing and engaging in a way that makes everybody feel comfortable and want to come back. There are various ways to support us. Um, the most first and foremost is following our code of conduct. Um, another way is we have a Discord. The link to our Discord is on our website and you can ask any questions and answer any questions there or share events. Um, we also have transcripts of all of our webinars on GitHub. And so if you want to um, contribute to editing, it's an open source project there. We have an open uh, collective of data umbrella. So, um, you know, uh, we appreciate any donations to help cover our operational costs. We are on all social media platforms of data umbrella. So you can, if you search on a search engine, um, the best place to find out about upcoming events is um, on our meetup uh, page. Uh, we have this, this, uh, webinar is being recorded and we'll have it up on our YouTube. We also have a job board and a newsletter. Um, and I'm going to post some of these links. Once I finish speaking, I'll post the links on the chat so you have easy access to them. We have um, on our YouTube, we have a few playlists that uh, you might find of interest. Um, the first one is contributing to open source. We did a series in the fall of open source. So there's scikit-learn, NumPy, Pandas and the core Python. So if you're interested in open source, um, they're, you know, they're good videos to check out. Um, we also career advice is always popular and we have three uh, excellent speakers who have shared their career advice. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for uh, work or if you're looking for advice, it's I always, you know, recommend these videos to people. And this is just a sampling of all of our other events that we've had. And, uh, you know, over time, they're slowly, you can see the views on YouTube getting higher. So people are enjoying them. We have a job board as well. So um, if you're looking, check out our job board. If you're at a company that is hiring, feel free to post um, on our job board. Uh, our website has a lot of resources. So we have a list of conferences, we have open source materials, we have guide to inclusive languages, inclusive language to use and allyship. So feel free to check it out. Uh, this is sort of a repeat. We're on all platforms at Data Umbrella. So depending on what platform you prefer, if you search for Data Umbrella, you'll find us. Um, we have our next upcoming event um, is in April and it is intuitive Bayesian modeling with Pi MC3 and Oriol will be presenting and I believe he's joining us from Europe, I think London, um, but this will be, um, this will be a fun event. And now I'm introducing today's speaker. Sam has actually spoken um, to our group before, so it's really great to have her back. Um, Sam is a data professional with a passion for turning high quality data into valuable insights. Sam has a PhD in computer science and has worked for several data focused startups. Um, in her current role as engineering director at Superconductor, she works on great expectations in the open source Python library for data validation and documentation. Sam is on um, three, uh, all three platforms as SP 
fail. Um, and I'm going to hand the mic over to her. And I'm joining from New York, and Sam is joining from Hawaii. And, uh, <laughs> please don't hate her. <laughs> and I'm going to turn off uh, my mic and my camera. If you have any questions, please post them on chat. And um, we'll sort of let Sam answer them whenever there's a good break in her presentation to answer them. All right, let me share my screen. Um, Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, so great to see everyone. I hope you can, yes, you can see my screen. Um, I am going to, so I'm on a small laptop right now. Um, so I won't be able to see the chat as I'm, as I'm speaking. Um, I might also have some uh, connection issues. So there's a chance I might just be turning off my, um, my video at some point because the slides are the interesting uh, part anyway. But um, yeah, please, uh, Rishma, if there's any connection issues, just like, uh, interrupt me and let me know and I can turn off my video. All right, let's get started um, with the uh, presentation. So um, I can already tell you that um, I have a lot of content. So I'm trying, I'm going, oh, and this is totally wrong. I am very sorry. This is not, this is a redo of a, oh, there you go. Fixed it. Um, so this is a repeat of a talk I gave at the Python Users Berlin um, uh, event in uh, November 2020, um, but it's it's sort of the the bulk of version and it has more hands-on examples, and I'm really really excited about it actually. So today I'm going to tell you about the great expectations and the wonderful world of data quality tools in Python. Um, Rishma has already done uh, an intro, so just to recap, I'm from Germany. I'm currently based in New York City. Right now I'm actually in Hawaii, so it is. 6.12 a.m. Um, please do uh, forgive me if I look a little sleepy. Um, I've done some research in semantic web technologies, so general like data things. Um, I've been doing data stuff for quite a while. Uh, I spent a lot of time working with third party healthcare data, which sort of started uh, getting me interested in data quality, because if you've ever worked with third party data that you just get from somewhere, especially healthcare data, um, you know, it's usually pretty messy and you have a lot of data quality issues. Uh, currently, I'm an engineering director at Superconductive, which is the company that's the core maintainers behind great expectations and open source uh, data quality tool. Um, in terms of the agenda for today, so I'm first of all just going to um, talk talk you give you a whirlwind tour of the wonderful world of open source data quality in python um, i'm going to uh, just like give a little bit of a categorization of the different types of data quality tools and then i'm going to um, actually uh, give you an overview of some prominent ones it's not comprehensive because there is a lot out there but it's sort of the most obvious ones that i've found when sort of searching around. And I'm actually also going to do live demos, which may or may not work, let's see. Um, in the second part, I'm going to do a little bit more of a deep dive into great expectations, depending on how much time we have. Um, I might do a full tutorial or I might do a, uh, um, I might just do a, you know, shorter version and, and just show, sort of show you the highlights of uh, getting started. So again, another live demo um, and then, Maybe, hopefully, we'll have time for Q&A. And as Rishma said, I'll also pause um, every once in a while to start uh, to to let you ask questions. But like I said, I currently only see my slides, so um, I'll have to shift back and forth. All right, let's get started. So why am I even talking about this? Why am I so, why do I care about data quality? Well, data pipelines and data workflows today are a little bit of a mess. Um, you have data pipelines that are very brittle. Um, you have data pipelines that often fail. Uh, in the best case scenario, they fail loudly. In the worst case scenario, they fail silently. The number of times we've heard, oh yeah, this thing has been wrong. Like this data point has been wrong in our analysis for like the past few weeks or it has been null or um, the data has actually not been updated. It has been stale and we only found out way too late, right? That kind of stuff hits us pretty frequently in the data world. Um, the other thing that's also interesting is that tacit knowledge about the data is usually scattered among domain experts. So you have some people who know about the domain, you have some people who know about the code, the business logic, um, but it's fairly poorly um, documented usually. Um, maintenance is time consuming, it's expensive, it's morale killing. Um, just fixing pipelines, having production fires all the time. I've I did that for over five years, and it's 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 a lot of work. 
um, data documentation or just sort of like understanding what your data looks like, frequently out of date. Um, and we really had uh, a few users at Great Expectation who said all these data issues just eroded trust in the data, trust in the data team, um, trust in like what we could do with the data. We, we never know whether it's up to date or whether this is actually reliable. And that just makes data pretty useless. Um, the thing is, there's lots of different tools to actually help with this. Um, so welcome to part one. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of the wonderful world of open source data quality tools in Python. Um, why am I focusing on Python? Well, I work with Python um, and it's just a very popular language, obviously for uh, anything data. Um, and why am I focused on open source? Well, that means um, we can all go and test it out and we don't have to pay for stuff. So um, it's a very small subset, obviously, of the, the world of tools that are out there but I'm just going to uh, give you a little bit of an overview there. Um, what I'm not going to do actually today is talk about the six dimensions of data quality. So first of all, when you think about data quality and categorizations of data quality, um, everyone always thinks about like the six dimensions of completeness, consistency, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not going to do that today, but instead I'm going to talk through um, my own sort of categorizations of data quality with um, sort of the perspective of the tools that accomplish a certain thing. Um, so I'm kind of looking at this on a spectrum. And again, this is something that I've kind of uh, made up. There is not that much literature out there, not that much sort of like high level um, thinking about data quality. It's usually very specific to things like this. Um, so just looking at sort of the landscape of tools, I didn't find any, you know, specific um, like, categorization or classification of tools. So I've made this up. If you do find something, if you're aware of something, please share it with me and I'm more than happy to um, fit my worldview into that. Um, but basically I'm looking at it on a spectrum from left to right, starting with what's called data profiling, which basically just means you're sort of getting an understanding of the shape of the data, um, you know, some uh, numeric values, some ranges, means, medians, um, distribution of categorical uh, variables, things like that. Um, data documentation, like just is pretty pretty closely related to data profiling, where you could have profile data plus some um, uh, domain knowledge, for example, or documentation of business logic in um, uh, in natural language, for example, or things like dependencies. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there on data documentation, um, data validation and testing. That to me is really the big one, which is kind of just like testing your code in uh, Python, PyTest or any other language where it's basically, okay, here's some things that I expect from my data. Here are some assertions. Do the, uh, does the data actually match those assertions? Um, then you have something called data version control, which is obviously also, if you think about um, data that is frequently updated, like on a daily basis or a monthly basis, right? You have things change um, quite frequently. The, the question is, how do you keep track of that? So there's data version control as a category. And then there's um, data cleaning, which really um, is sort of the counterpoint to almost like data validation where I say, okay, I found something that I don't want in my data. Um, how do I get rid of that? Or how do I uh, modify my data? And there's a bunch of like automated tools there too. So I'm kind of like arranging this on the spectrum of amount of modification. Um, the, the classification is certainly not perfect. I think that might require some iteration still. Um, whoops. Okay. So, um, in terms of the tools that I'm presenting, there's lots and lots and lots of different tools in the space. So I focused on single purpose tools rather than end to end data processing packages. Um, so I try to really narrow it down to sort of like, okay, these are actually data quality related rather than, oh, here's a data pipeline tool that does everything and there's also some testing built in. Um, so to anyone here who uses DBT, I'm not going to mention DBT, even though there's a data testing um, uh, functionality in DBT, for example. Um, I found it, again, like surprisingly hard to find a lot of open source, like Python data quality packages. Um, the commercial space has grown really quickly. So you, um, not necessarily Python related, but you've heard of things like Monte Carlo, for example, that's growing pretty uh, quickly. A lot of the um, 
open source tools aren't necessarily actively maintained. Um, so just as a heads up, I marked the active projects that had some activity, some release, or something happening on GitHub in the past six months. I've marked it with a little asterisk in my in my list. And again, like let me know if I've missed anything. Um, this is certainly um, not complete. All right. In terms of the example that I'm going to be using when I do the demo, um, I'm looking at New York City taxi data, of course, taxi uh, New York data. Um, and I just want to basically compare two data sets from January 2019 and from February 9, 2019. And this is the number of passengers per ride in a in a uh, so we have in a data, we have one ride, one ride per row. So each row represents one ride. Um, and you have things like the start and, and end date of that ride. You have uh, the borrow uh, for pickup and drop off. You have the fare amount, so how much people have paid. You have the tax, et cetera, et cetera. And you also have the number of passengers that are in each uh, cab. And um, naturally you would expect that this is kind of um, pretty self-explanatory that you have sort of a natural limit of, of six passengers. There's not uh, many larger cabs and you have almost no rides with zero passengers, which makes perfect sense. There should actually be probably absolutely none, um, but you might have some errors in there that, that actually just have zero, but you know, it's, it's negligible and the majority of people, uh, the majority of rides have exactly one passenger. So that makes perfect sense. Um, so what I want to show in terms of uh, all the tools that we're using is what kind of tools can we um, use to figure out, to detect things like this, for example, that all of a sudden in February 2019, so in the subsequent month, we have a spike um, in these zero values, which clearly seems seems off. So it seems like it looks like we have a drop here from um, uh, the one column from one right, uh, one rider, one passenger down to down to zero. So something clearly went wrong here. And I wanted to see if like what the different tools can do this sort of help us get a feeling of this data quality issue in, in lots of different ways. Um, I am going to be switching back and forth between the slides and my notebook um, in this next part. I hope that works. Um, and like I said, I will stop uh, occasionally to uh, take questions. Right, so if you just think of the um, the little uh, you know flow that we have, uh, we start out with data profiling. Um, in terms of pure profiling tools, um, the two big ones that we have are in pandas. You have pandas data frame describe. You have the describe method, and then you have a cool tool called pandas profiling, um, which is an open source Python project um, that is a very very sophisticated extension of describe. Um, I wouldn't even call it just extension anymore. It's basically a very sophisticated replacement of that um, that creates a very detailed profile of your data. Um, and again, like to me, this is not necessarily data quality in the sense of like data testing but looking at the data and understanding the shape of the data will help you um, see certain data quality issues already. So to me, these are very, very tightly coupled. And I am going to actually demo this now. All right, so um, I hope this is big enough. This is my notebook. Um, I'm going to close these because I just added the slide. Um, so first of all, this is my, um, I'm just importing some stuff. Um, at the top, just like standard pandas imports. Then I'm loading my January CSV file. So again, we have a vendor ID. Um, we have the pickup, drop off, the passenger count. That's the column we want to focus on, and the amount of uh, the amount of money that was paid. I've shrunk that down quite a lot. The the original file has a lot more columns. And then we also have the February file. So our data frame two has the um, and I can also run that. Oh. Sorry, we have to actually execute everything. Um, data frame two has the exact same structure. Um, cool. So let's just look at uh, pandas describe as the sort of baseline for profiling. And I'm just doing data frame one describe, and it gives me four of my numeric columns for vendor ID that it doesn't even make sense. It, it's a numeric column, but it should be a string really, or it should be considered an integer, uh, sorry, uh, an identifier. So I don't really need the min max and stuff. Passenger count, it gives me the min, it gives me the max, it gives me the mean. 
and fair amount it also gives me the uh, numeric values this one's also an interesting one apparently i have negative uh 52 dollars um as a fair amount so even just like very simple profiling right even this already gives you some insights and so okay something something looks weird here um oh and the max is three thousand dollars <laughs> which i also hope is not a true um uh, uh fair anyone had to pay okay so that's pandas described not very eventful but it gives us some insights already into data quality um, the next thing I'm doing here is really straightforward. So Panos Profiling, the thing I really like about it is like super simple to use. You literally just import Panos Profiling, um, you import a class called Report, and then you just generate the report. In this case, I'm generating it from my, um, my first data frame, so the January data, and it outputs it, uh, I can use it to notebook iframe, and it just outputs an HTML report within my notebook, which is pretty cool. So I'm just going to run this. I'm gonna have to make this a little bit smaller maybe. And it is generating, rendering some really good looking HTML. So it gives me an overview of the number of variables, number of observations, the so number of rows, missing cells, duplicates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then if we look at our variables, it gives me a really cool overview of each one of those variables, including distribution on the right-hand side. So you can see my vendor ID is one, two, and four. Um, and I can scroll down, I can scroll down to my passenger count. And it tells me that here, my passenger count is between one and six. Um, and uh, I can even see more details here. So this is where it gets like, you can get like the median 95th percentile. You can have see the histogram of actual values. So that's the one I mentioned um, where you have between one and six passengers, um, common values, extreme values, et cetera, et cetera. So this is super, super cool. It gives you like a huge rep um, uh, report. It even tells you correlations between different columns, which, I don't think makes any sense here, but depending on your data is super useful. Okay, so that's the um, profile for uh, for data frame one. And now I'm just going to run this for data frame two. So that's a February data set, as I mentioned, and that's um, the uh, data set that, like I said, has some issues with that passenger count column. So again, I'll keep scrolling down and, ooh, look at this. I have a spike in zeros here. So I'm going to, uh, again, show the details, show histogram, and this looks very different, right? So this is kind of just by eyeballing, by looking at it, I can see, oh, there is some difference between those two um, data frames. Obviously, if I'm doing this for, um, you know, for multiple subsequent data, uh, data frames or files, if I'm looking at like every single month and I want to trace changes over months, that is not very helpful, right? Because I have to do it just like by looking at it. But if I'm comparing two things, um, you know, this is a pretty nice, very quick overview to give you an idea of what your data looks like. Okay, so that was profiling. Um, like I said, I haven't found any other like sort of solid uh, open source uh, profiling tools, but again, let me know if you have any. Um, I'm going to cap, uh, just tackle the next category too, and then I'm gonna pause for, um, for questions real quick. Right, so that was profiling. Um, next up we have um, profiling and validation. And again, like this is sort of, I tried to arrange things uh, on, on the spectrum, but it's not like a perfect, um, you know, perfect uh, um, disjointed uh, categories or, or tools, like each tool kind of does a little bit of everything. So in this case, I'm actually jumping right to profiling and validation. Um, the tools I'm looking at here are TDDA, Test Driven Data Analysis, um, PyDQC, Python Data Quality Check, I think, Control. Um, and then the other one I also have is Great Expectations, kind of in that same in that same category of like mixing uh, validation with some profiling capabilities. Um, so I'm going to, again, uh, show just the ones that are actually actively developed. Um, PyDQC hasn't had any movement in quite a while, um, as it just happens with open source projects. Sometimes they just sort of, uh, you know, get left behind. Um, cool. So TDDA is another Python library that allows you to specify and verify constraints on data, and it provides some lightweight profiling. So what TDDA does is basically it looks at um, uh, you know, some category, uh, some 
characteristics of your data, kind of like what the profiler does, and then says, okay, this is sort of what the data is supposed to look like. Now, if you validate uh, another data frame um, or another file or another database table with that sort of template, um, does the new data set sort of match uh, what you've had previously? So I'm also going to show this. So TDA is pretty cool. Um, again, just importing uh, TDDA. Right here. Um, then there is a method called discover df, um, where I'm really just passing in again my uh, January data frame. Um, I'm outputting uh, the constraints. It's outputting sort of like, oh, this is what I found about your data. This is what your data is supposed to look like. Um, I'm outputting that to a constraints file. And then just, I mean, I'm just writing this uh, file. And I can actually show you what constraints have been um, uh, generated, which is really cool. So it basically just looks at every single field, right? We have vendor ID, pickup date time, drop off date time, passenger count, fair amount. And it tells me um, it, it creates uh, different types of constraints. So type constraint for the data type. It says, oh, I found an integer here. Um, minimum constraint, maximum. So it says like the min value here is uh, one, the max value is four, the signs is a positive, negative. Um, and then max null. So, and it does that. I can show you for the passenger count. And again, it finds that our uh, minimum in the passenger count column is one and the maximum is six. Makes perfect sense, right? This is exactly what we, what we expect. Um, and then we can uh, use that to verify. So there's another function called verify data frame, um, which allows us to verify um, another data frame. In this case, as the first example, I'm just using the constraints I've generated from the January data to verify itself, just to show that this is like a null op, right? Um, they're like, that should just pass sort of spuriously. Um, so if we're doing that, I can show you that that's exactly what happened. So this is a pretty nice uh, print output where it just, okay, type matches, min maxes, match matches, sign maxes, max nulls, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these match and it tells you how many constraints pass, how many constraints fail. So this is super simple. Um, one thing that you can do here with TDA is it's an epsilon, um, which basically just means your um, like threshold that you can set for how much should actually pass, uh, how much match in order to for the constraints to still pass. So you can add some wiggle room here. Okay, and then um, I am going to execute this for the uh, February data frame, and you can you probably know what's going to happen. Uh, this passenger count column, we already know from the profiling what we looked at. We know that the min is zero, so the min won't uh, won't match here, um, and we'll probably have a failure there. So I'm running this for the for the February data for the second data frame, and. As predicted, we have two constraints failing, 20 constraints passing, so the constraints that are failing are passenger count. We have the um, min value failing, as I said, and then we have the uh, sign check failing too, um, because uh, I, I, I'm not actually sure um, how it considers, like how it treats uh, zeros in in there, um, but clearly it doesn't, uh, it doesn't just find all positive um, signs, so it also fails here. Okay, so this was um, the uh, first um, sort of like testing plus profiling tool. So in this case, the, the difference between other testing tools is that you don't have to um, really know anything about your data, right? It profiles it, it tells you what's the min and what's the max, and then you can just apply that to another data frame. And that's actually, so um, I'm saving great expectations for the second part of this, that's actually exactly how great expectations uh, can do it too. So you don't have to know a ton about your data, which is pretty neat. I'm going to stop real quick and see if anyone has questions. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, people are excited about Pandas profiling. Yes, it's great. Um, we actually did a collaboration with uh, Simon, who's the core maintainer behind great, uh, Pandas profiling. And there is actually a, uh, Pandas profiling two expectations um, method. So you can output a great expectations like test set, um, like kind of like a constraints file, what I've just found, shown with TDDA in Pandas profiling. So super cool. Um, data profile on a big data set using Pandas profiling. I don't actually know how much um, Pandas profiling can handle, but 12 million rows for a Pandas data frame seems too much. Um, it seems very large. So Pandas, um, 
doesn't handle very, very large uh, data frames very well. Um, you probably have to switch to um, Spark data frames, for example, and then, or the other option would be to consider some sort of partitioning, right? That you split your um, data into, into chunks. Like for example, in this case, I could split it by vendor ID or I could split it by day and then just do like the profiling by day. Um, but I'm not aware of anything that does it for like really, really large data set. Yeah, um, arrow, so file formats. Yeah, I'm, great question. Um, I will uh, look into that, that sounds really good. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll just jump back to my, uh, my content. Sam, there was one yeah. more question in Q&A. Mm -hmm. I'll happy to, I'm happy to read it. It's, um, oh, there's a Q&A. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, yeah. Um, so Amos asked, I do qu data quality checks and wanted to know, is it possible to get aggregate data quality in terms of attainment to generate report as PDF or other formats? Um, well, it depends on the tool that you're working with, right? I am going to present a few more tools, so maybe I can, um, uh, Sorry, what's the word? I, I can I can uh, go back, come back to that question at the end when we have uh, present, like when we've looked at all the different tools and then see if that's, that's a fit. All right, great, uh, let's go back. So we are now at, um, so like I said, PyDQC, um, pretty similar to that. So again, basic stats about the table and then co compares, um, does a comparison, so it's, it's I looked at it, it, the examples are pretty similar, but I don't have like a specific uh, demo for that. And like I said, the next one is Great Expectations, which is actually very similar to TDA, but in addition, it shows you which um, like rows and columns actually violate those, um, uh, those constraints or those assertions. Um, you can uh, output a, a report, a data quality report, um, so credit expectations kind of has like all the bells and whistles. Um, which, so I'm going to show that at the end. Um, cool. So in terms of pure data validation or testing tools, uh, I am going to show. Yep, there's a handful. So there's a lot. Okay. So there's called Bulwark, um, which adds uh, tests on methods that return pandas data frames. Um, and it has some built-in tests, and then you can also uh, just write custom uh, custom methods for tests, which is pretty cool. Um, OnGuard, which is not in active development anymore, which is basically kind of a precursor to Bulwark. Um, there's a tool called Voluptuous, um, which allows you to specify a schema to validate JSON and YAML. So the example they use a lot is, um, you know, uh, for example, querying the Twitter API and getting a bunch of uh, JSON back. There's Opulent Pandas, which is, a data frame focused version of Voluptuous, actually, and this is not right because Voluptuous Pandas is actually not in active development anymore, which is why I'm not showing it. Um, I had some trouble installing it. Um, there is Moby DQ, Moby Dick, good, good joke, uh, good pun, um, which is a web app um, that allows you to check for indicators. So Moby Dick is really like a pretty big tool. Um, I am not demoing it. I only have some screenshots because it's it's pretty heavyweight. Um, and yeah, those are those are the uh, uh, like pure sort of data validation testing tools where you kind of have to specify um, your uh, stuff like your constraints and stuff yourself up front. So I'm going to show Bulwark, Voluptuous, and then some screenshots of Moby Day. Okay. So Bulwark, um, also pretty straightforward, pretty self-explanatory. You import Bulwark um, and the way in Bulwark you define your tests or assertions is by just adding decorators to the method that um, returns your data frame. Um, so this method will, um, I have some built-in checks on here, has no NANDs, um, is shaped, so it has 10,000 rows, five columns. It has values within range, so this is what we care about, um, where we say, okay, we want the passenger count column to be between one and six. Okay, so I'm basically kind of doing what uh, I've just done with TDDA, um, but uh, I have to sort of specify it myself and I have to know the range myself. Okay. Um, then I have, like I said, my, my just a little method here. This is a really silly method. Obviously, you'd probably want to, um, you know, use it more on like a method that does actually actual calculations that computes your data frame. 
Um, and you just want to make sure that any changes that you make to your data frame code or any changes that happen to your uh, data are, are uh, sort of have like a safety net, net of your tests. Um, yeah, and then you can just basically run this. This uh, method returns a data frame if everything works, if all the tests pass, and it fails with an error if any of the tests fail. So in this case, um, again, I'm loading my January data, and I know my January data matches um, my expectations. It's spuriously true. Um, so this returns a data frame. So now if I'm testing the February data, um, and I know the passenger count column is uh, not within that range. We have a zero here. So I'm running this. And um, it looks like something failed, but it actually failed correctly. It failed outside range, zero. And then it actually tells me how many, um, which call, not necessarily how many, but like it gives me a head, a little snapshot of which, um, which rows or how many rows uh, actually failed it. Okay. Um, so that is bulwark. Um, it's pretty neat, and again, like you can, it has a bunch of built-in uh, checks. Um, you can use the built-in ones, or you can just de define your own, and you just put your decorator on there. You can also use Bulwark just like right in the code by just importing uh, uh, your checks directly, and then say checks is shape this, and check blah, 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 the name of the method. So in this case, you can see this is, Exactly, the syntax is identical to what I used in the decorator. The only thing is this is um, uh, what you call a snake case, and the other one was camel case. Uh, the decorator was a camel case. The methods themselves, the check methods are a snake case, but the decorators really just use the, um, the check methods. So you can run this, and we have the exact same. Uh, let me actually do this first. So I'm just checking the shape. That returns a data frame, right? So this is this is perfectly fine. And then the second one um, failed for the exact same reason because I have values outside my range. So that was uh, bulwark, super straightforward. Um, and like I said, you can also define your own um, uh, methods on that. Uh, the next one I've got, and again, I'm just going to stop real quick after this uh, after this section. Next one I have is uh, voluptuous or opulent pandas. Um, pretty funny names. So Voluptus, like I said, um, allows you to specify what they call schema to validate JSON or YAML. Um, and then Opulent Pandas is a version of Voluptus, not really a version, but it's heavily inspired by Voluptus, um, which is does the same thing, but directly on data frames. So I had to do a little bit of coercing to get my um, data frames to match the uh, like dictionary structure that's ex expected by um, voluptuous. So I just um, implemented a little method here. Um, again, you just import uh, voluptuous. Um, you define your schema, which is really just uh, a dictionary of here's my column and here's all the constraints that I want for my, oh, I should have a comma. Um, here's my, um, the column name and all the constraints that I want to assert on this particular column. So vendor ID, I just said, okay, integer. And then um, for my passenger count column, again, it should be between one and six. This is getting pretty repetitive, you get the idea, but I like using a like running example because now you have hopefully a very good mental model of kind of what things look like. And then you can say extra, um, allow extra, which means I'm only specifying schema for those two columns. There's other columns in my data frame, but I'm not care. I don't care about those. Um, and then what I had to do here, this is just some cursing again uh, to convert my data frame to a dictionary, um, and then just loop over it and, and uh, validate it per row. So again, I am starting out with my data frame one, which I know passes. Oh, does it? Oh, name schema is not defined. I should probably end this. Boom, and it returns a data frame. Okay. And then the second one, again, I'm validating my February data and it tells me, well, you must be at least one for dictionary, blah, blah, blah. So again, it fails with uh, an error there um, because it doesn't match the uh, constraint. Okay, and the last one in the section of data quality stuff is Moby Dick. And um, like I said, I'm only going to show a screenshot here because that is a whole 
a big web app. So in order to get started, you have to run Docker, you run it in a Docker container, you run all these things. And um, I kind of thought, okay, this is this is sort of outside of what I want to show here. Um, so this is a pretty big, uh, chunky web app, but it really is focused on workflows in terms of indicators for your data quality. Um, it has dashboards, it has reports. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty hefty um, sort of data, almost like management uh, platform. All right. Um, so those are sort of the data validation tools where you kind of just specify um, stuff uh, and, 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 um, and you kind of like specify your constraints yourself. Um, we have, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, no questions in the chat. Okay. In that case, I'm going to uh, going to move on in a second. Mm. You can also probably tell it's getting light behind me, so the sun is rising in Hawaii now. <laughs> um, great. Let's move on. We have one more category, um, which is data version control. Um, so for data version control, really the only one I found is DVC data version control, which is built on top of Git. Um, and it offers version control specific for data and for machine learning models. DVC is pretty complex. It's almost outside of the uh, my sort of um, criteria of I just want to demo single purpose tools. It's actually pretty complex. So. Um, and it's a command line tool, so I've only got um, a bunch of screenshots in my notebook. So um, DVC basically assumes you have data files in your Git repository, um, but also at the same time, you can store those data files somewhere else. For example, S3 buckets, that, that's kind of the, the typical way to do it, but you can version control those files, even if they're stored somewhere else, via your regular Git repository. So the reason why you probably don't want to keep a lot of like big data files in Git and actually have them version controlled via Git is just because it's really slow. Like Git was meant for code. Git was not necessarily meant to version control, you know, hundreds of thousands of rows of uh, data files. Um, that's not, that was not the idea behind it. So it's not particularly good at it. It's pretty slow at it. So the idea with DVC is that you can basically have your version control still handled via repo, via your repository, but the data actually lives somewhere else. Um, and the thing that you do is you basically just run, you pip install uh, DVC. They also have a web app, um, like a, a paid, like a premium version, but they have an open source version. So you just run DVC in it. Um, that just creates a bunch of uh, files um, for configuration in your in your repository that takes, uh, takes care of stuff. And then what you do is you add all the files that you have. And what it does is it creates a .dvc um, file version, which is a tiny, tiny file that basically just keeps track of the state of your, um, of your actual data file. Um, and then you can um, use, uh, I think it's dvc push, um, where you can basically uh, set a remote, like another remote, like an S3 bucket, for your data files and then just push them there. And um, it also adds the actual CSV files to the git ignore. Okay, so you basically say, okay, I no, I'm taking, I'm managing version controlling my data file because you have the .dvc file that's under version control and that allows you to revert to previous versions um, or do diffs, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, I'm not just pushing huge files around like between Git all the time. Um, so it's pretty cool. It has a ton more features like doing like running um, ML pipelines at different versions of your data and stuff. So please do go look it up. It's super, super complex and there's a lot um, going on. Uh, the documentation is really good though. All right, so that's, uh, that's DVC. And then the last category we have is uh, data cleaning. So data cleaning, it basically the idea is, oh, I find something weird in my data. Um, I don't want that to go into my analysis, so please do get rid of it. So we have tools like dedupe, um, which uses fuzzy matching to perform deduplications. Um, we have data cleaner, which uh, as far as I can tell is not actively maintained. Um, so it does things like dropping rows with missing values, it co-strings with numeric values. So just like the general stuff that you do 
um, for data qual uh, data cleaning. And again, to me, that's closely related to data quality because like you kind of want to detect your issues or like what's not so great in your data. And then you also want to fix it, right, in order to have high quality data. Um, so just going to show dedupe real quick. Um, in this case, I have to be honest, like my, unfortunately, my beautiful uh, running example of the taxi data kind of breaks down because we don't have duplicate uh, values in there. And because dedupe is also more suited based on what I can tell for um, things that are kind of string matches. Um, so the biggest example they use is uh, like um, customer records, for example, like matching names, right? You have this the person with like, the same name, maybe they have a middle name, maybe they have the same address, but it's maybe slight, it's spelled slightly differently. So they actually use um, like fuzzy matching to determine whether records are um, uh, like different or identical. And in my taxi data, as you have seen, it, it, it's a little hard to tell, but I can um, I can just show you the, um, I'll, I'll show you the workflow regardless. Um, so what I do is, um, I uh, basically just set all my input files, my setting file, training file. So my input here is my first CSV. I read this into the data frame. Um, I define which fields I want to use in order to detect duplicates. So I'm just picking a couple of uh, fields here, date, time, and fair amount. Again, this is this doesn't work uh, with integers. Um, so I had to like pick some other fields. Um, and then I'm running <laughs> dduper. Uh, dedupe, um, which is a dedupe, uh, the deduper class. I'm preparing my training uh, set uh, based on my uh, data frame. And then I'm actually doing an interactive label, which is really cool. So I can run this. This actually takes uh, a little bit to run. Yep. So now it's basically what it does is it looks at my data frame and then it shows me uh, a, a few snippets of the data, um, a few pairs of rows and says like, are these identical? So this is kind of pretty fun actually. And I like the UI here. So it says, these are the two rows. Are they, do these refer to the same thing? Yes, no, unsure, finished. So I could say, yes, these are actually identical or these are the same thing. And I keep um, repeating that until um, I'm done with it. I'm finished labeling. And obviously in this particular case, like that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense because none of these records are identical, right? Um, and in the case, if they were identical, there wouldn't be any fuzziness about it because it would just be an exact match. Okay, and now I can train my model. And like I said, this, oh, uh, no, I had to, I had to do some more labeling. Okay, give me, give me my labels. Let's see, let's see, let's see. It takes a little while. Um, but yeah, so I think dduper is really cool in cases where you have, like I said, user data, customer data, um, names, addresses, where you're like, oh, this is the same person or this is the same thing. So I'm just gonna keep telling yes, yes, no. Hmm. Okay, and then I'm going to finish. So now I have more training data. So now it's training my model, my really, uh, not very helpful model. Um, once the model is trained, I can just save my um, training data, my settings data. Um, and then I'm just gonna show this uh, because this takes a while. What I do at the end is I get my uh, deduper. Um, I can partition uh, my data um, based on the what I've just learned from my data. And um, the partitioning basically just returns a cluster ID uh, for each a cluster ID field for every single one of my rows, where it basically just tells me to which cluster it belongs. So two identical rows or fuzzy identical, fuzzy matching rows would be considered to be part of the same cluster. Um, and like I said, this doesn't work because my... Uh, um, because in this case, it doesn't necessarily um, really make sense. All right, uh, we're running a little behind on time as I've predicted. So I am going to uh, now skip to um, great expectations and just show you sort of the basics of great expectations. Um, might not get to a live demo. Okay, um, so let's go back to my slides. 
So just to wrap that up, that was uh, pretty much all the open source data quality tools that I've uh, that I found. Um, and now I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive into one of them, Great Expectations, which covers the data uh, validation slash testing, um, profiling, and uh, documentation use case. So imagine, again, this is really just a recap. You get a monthly data refresh. So you have your taxi data is data updated on say the, the last day of the month or the first of every month, um, you have your pipelines, your ETL pipelines, you have your storage, and then you have your data products. Um, that means anything that happens here in a data that's wrong will just go straight into your dashboards, into your data products, and it will look wrong, right? Um, we want to prevent that. So a better way to do this is you get your data, you validate your data, you test it, you alert if something's wrong, maybe you stop your pipelines, um, so if that if the tests don't pass, um, you just say Boop, stop it. Um, if the tests do pass, um, you can actually then continue doing your processing uh, and getting um, your dashboards. Uh, and this is where um, great expectations fits in. It's sort of the validation step here. Um, you, you could even do even more testing. You can uh, test your source data. And you can test your uh, data after you've done the transformation, right? To make sure like your code wasn't like messed up and, and did something silly. Um, and at each step, you can kind of alert um, and uh, sub the pipelines or continue running if, if the test pass. Okay, so this is kind of the world that we operate in with uh, great expectations. The idea is kind of it's integrated into an entire pipeline rather than doing sort of like the ad hoc, like manual checks of running stuff in notebook, even though you can do that too. All right. Um, so the output of uh, great expectations is what's called data docs, um, which is a data quality report. It's just an HTML file. Um, it tells you we have an expectation suite. So a suite is just a bunch of tests does like a test suite in Python, um, and it can tell you uh, it can tell you whether it's passed or failed, um, because um, uh, we can express what we expect from our data. So in this case, as you can see here in data docs, I have an output that says here it's a passenger count column. I asserted that the values must always be between one and six, and it tells me that I found unexpected values. And it tells me that the unexpected value is zero. So if you think back to all the other example I've shown you previously, it does the same thing, just kind of like in a nice way. It tells you which values are unexpected, tells you the actual percentage, so it just gives you a lot more information than some of the other tools. Okay, so what's great expectations? Another open source Python library. Um, basically, it just in your data project, so where your pipelines are, um, it runs. Um, it has like a little subdirectory with all the configurations and stuff and the great expectations of YAML, the configuration file. Um, and it has um, expectation suites that are stored just in JSON. So it's basically like the constraints file kind of that we've seen, just your list of uh, assertions. Like I want this column to have these values um, are stored in your expectations file. Um, an expectation is just a method that does exactly this. So if you think back to like a uh, bulwark, for example, where you have your check, um, it it does the same thing. I, I don't even this is this is a pretty nice setup because you this is I think self-explanatory now at this point that you just say, okay, this is my method, and um, it actually gets stored as Python. Um, so you can uh, you know read and uh, uh, invoke it from pretty much anywhere. And you can also uh, render these as in like a human readable form as we've just seen in uh, uh, in the data docs. Um, so one thing that's really cool, and I'm going to take a quick break just, just in case people have to drop off uh, in the next two minutes. So I'm just going to do the intro and then take a very, very quick break to answer questions. And then um, if people want to stick around, I can do a live demo. Um, so Great Expectations also has built-in profiling to scaffold expectations. So basically what we say is you can use some historical data Right, you look at, let's say, the January data. You use the built-in profiler um, along with some domain expertise to kind of, you know, confirm that yes, whatever the profiler has found makes sense, and then you get to those uh, expectations, to so those assertions. And then once you have those assertions, you can use them to run them against future data. So in this case, validate the February data, March, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So anything that comes after. Um, I'm actually going to skip this. So this is a really interesting uh, sample architecture. So everywhere where you see the blue T 
HTE uh, diamonds, we basically you can implement a data quality check with uh, great expectations. So, so again, um, the idea of great expectations is really that you just check at multiple points in your in your pipeline, um, which is pretty cool. Um, great expectations supports pretty much any backend, so you're not limited to pandas data frames. You can throw it right at your um, uh, any kind of data storage pretty much at this point, I think. Um, so it supports Snowflake, uh, which I think is super popular these days, um, Postgres, anything basically that can be accessed via SQL Alchemy. Um, it supports uh, Spark data frames. Um, it, uh, it's integrated into things like Apache Airflow. So we have an Airflow operator. It's integrated into Daxter. So um, you basically just have, again, like the, the, the idea of great expectation is very deeply sort of anchored into the data pipeline, um, data engineering ecosystem, rather than sort of being just like uh, one-off checks. OK, um, so we are at time, as predicted. We're a little bit over. Um, so I'm actually going to pause real quick to take questions, and then I'll just do a very brief live demo in about five minutes. I'm just going to stop for those who have to um, drop off. Um, yeah, and uh, as Reshma said, we also um, we record the uh, presentation, so you can also just watch the, the end here. Um, any questions so far? Uh, so Jennifer mentioned that <clears throat> PyJanitor um, is very useful for data cleaning. Awesome. I am actually going to take a note of that. Um, PyJanitor, that's a funny, funny name. Um, let me actually, I am literally just going to put this uh, on here. PyJanitor. Boom. Done. I will look into that. That sounds great. Okay. Um, so Laura asked, how would you define expectations for the deceptively simple example of an e-commerce site where I pipeline the orders and I want to make sure that my daily orders don't go out of whack, but I have weekly, seasonal, et cetera, variation, hopefully grown baseline, daily orders are naturally increasing. Fantastic questions. Yeah. Um, so this is, so Laura basically asked, like, how do I um, take into account almost like seasonality or, or like natural occurring changes, right? Like trends in the data. Um, this is something that um, is currently not possible in any of the tools that I'm actually aware of, which is super interesting. I know it's definitely top of our minds for great expectations, so specifically seasonality. And by seasonality, I mean um, we expect like any kind of, it's either actual seasonality as in like we just expect like the number of let's say taxi rides to be maybe uh, higher in winter than in summer because in summer people tend to walk because the weather is nicer, right? Or seasonality in sense of we expect the usage of Slack to be higher during the week because people work than on weekends, right? Um, so so there's uh, you know different sort of time sensitivity. That's definitely something that we're working on with great expectations. Um, I am not aware of other tools. There's um, like the non-open source tools might have some more like sophisticated, uh, you know, methods to actually determine those things. Um, but uh, yeah, it's that's that's a fantastic question. Right now, I think the answer is like, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Laura. Oops, uh, that's pretty not satisfying, I guess. Um, so Ben asked if great expectations with database uh, constraints. Um, fantastic questions. It does not. Um, I really like the idea. You kind of have to like redefine what define in your database constraints. I guess it does it to some extent um, because you're, you know, if you do profiling, if you just like look at your data and all the data in your database already um, matches the database constraints, it will infer those um, and you can apply them um, to future data. But it, it will infer it sort of implicitly, but it does not read database constraints. Um, we It's an open source project. If you want to open a GitHub issue or uh, submit a PR to do that, super exciting, super interesting. Yeah, great question. Um, so now we've had a few people drop off, um, but I'm going to do a very, very brief uh, demo of great expectations, just real quick. Um, Okay, let's let's get the party started. So I'm actually going to kill off my notebook here. Um, and hopefully I can just, oh, no kernel's running. That kernel's running. Excuse me, dead kernel. Oh, already killed my kernel. 
All right. This. Okay, so the first thing you do after you've installed Great Expectations is you run Great Expectations in it. Um, and like I said, that just creates a little scaffold of uh, a directory and some configuration files, as you can see here. So I'm just going to continue with that. It then asks me if I would like to configure a data source. In this case, sure, I'll configure a data source. So a data source is basically just like, where does your data live? Um, it asks you, do you want to uh, connect to files in a file system or a relational database? Oh, and by the way, I can configure an infinite number of data sources. So I'm just showing one, but you can have multiple data sources, which is also kind of cool at Great Expectations. Just, um, again, it's sort of like a Swiss army knife almost. Um, in this case, I'm just uh, connected to file in a file system. Um, which is basically just my, uh, I have a directory called data that has the CSV files for those taxi um, rides in here. So I'm just going to say one, I'm processing my files with pandas. Uh, I don't have Spark installed and I'm just saying it's in the data directory. Um, I'm going to keep data there. Um, yes, I want to proceed. I don't want to profile expectation. And I'm just going to show this real quick. Uh, all right, so this is basically the uh, directory that was created, um, which is a great expectations directory within my uh, current directory, which has, like I said, the great expectations YAML. And then it has subdirectory for to store expectations, to store what we call checkpoint, which is to run validation. Uh, um, it has a directory called uncommitted, which has some of the connection, like strings, for example, if we were to connect to a database and a bunch of other stuff like um, the rendered HTML, for example, and validation results because they might uh, contain sensitive data. Everything else uh, would be under version control. Okay, so uh, now that I have a data source, um, I actually want to create a new expectation suite, which is uh, done using command suite scaffold. So scaffold again means run the profiler, do whatever uh, you know you want to do. Oh, and I have to provide the suite name. So it's great, very creative. And um, then it asked me, okay, so you want to scaffold a suite? You want to like. Uh, create expectations or assertions based on existing data. Where is the existing data? So I'm going to say, okay, use the February, uh, January data set, right? This is what I want to use as sort of my template to create my constraints. And it will do this. And it will pop open notebook. Uh, great expectations will pop open notebooks pretty frequently because we don't have a fancy UI yet um, that is in progress. So there will be uh, an actual um, platform, a web platform um, that allows you to sign up and you get all the fancy UI to edit your tests and edit your expectations and stuff. In absence of that, we currently just have uh, pre-populated notebooks. Okay, so this is, um, you can ignore most of this. This basically just gives you a uh, an object called a batch, and a batch is basically um, the data um, as paired with an expectation suite. So it's basically like, okay, I'm ready to start adding expectations now. The next thing I do with my scaffolder is I, um, well, I don't want to ignore the columns. With my scaffolder is I basically say which columns do I actually want to create expectations for because obviously sometimes you don't want to create expectations for all of them. In this case, I'm not ignoring any. I want to just create, actually tell you what, I am going to ignore most of these and I'm only going to create expectations for passenger count um, and see if it creates the right expectation. Okay, so now we have a profiler. Again, there's lots and lots of stuff you can um, you can configure. You can say, okay, which columns do you want to ignore? Um, there's something that's called semantic types, which is super, super cool, where, for example, remember how uh, in the describe method, it gave me the min and max for vendor ID when ID is just, I don't care about the min and max, so treat it as an integer. Um, so I can, uh, in my semantic types, I can implement an override. It's just a dictionary, really. I can say, okay, vendor ID, yes, it's stored as an integer, but please just treat it as a string. Like, don't give me the min max, just treat it as, uh, or a categorical va uh, variable. In this case, it would make the most sense to treat it as a categorical va variable, right? Um, so I can do the override, not gonna show that here. And then I can say profiler build suite, 
and it actually just profiles it and tells me um, which um, uh, expectations it's building the, uh, sorry, which columns it's uh, building expectations for. Uh, I'm not sure why ignored columns. Oh, ah, this is, this is the other way around. I don't want to ignore passenger count. This is silly. I just flipped it, huh? Okay, so now I want, okay. Now it only creates expectations for passenger counts, duh. Okay, so this is what it, um, what it does. And then I can basically just save my expectation suite. And I can also really nice um, run uh, validation immediately to see, okay, what does this expectation suite actually look like? And again, this is kind of similar to what I've done previously. Remember when I just ran um, my assertions on the same data frame that I used to create those assertions, just to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that it looks the way I expect it to look. Okay, so this is the profiler output. So it's created a bunch of table level expectations where it says, okay, it has the table has those columns. Um, uh, it has this number of rows. And then it gives you a lot of expectations about the passenger count column. There is a setting to also exclude expectations to say, okay, I don't actually want to have, um, let's say quantile expectations, for example, in here. And it tells me that values must belong to the set. So it must be one, two, three, four, five, six. Makes perfect sense. Okay, so this is step one, right? I create my expectation suite. This is now saved in my, um, I can actually go back and, oh, oops, I can go back here. If I go in great expectations, expectations, you can see I have, I now have my suite.json, so it stores it. I can version control it if I want. And then if I go back, um, I am going to do this in a very hacky way. But basically, if I want to um, uh, validate my second file, I basically just have to create another batch that I want to validate. And this is using what we call the V2 API. So there's a V3 API where the batch is now called validator. But for now, I'm just going to show it this way. So I'm just going to like hack this a little bit and say, OK, now I want to have a batch for my February data. As you can see, I've just changed it to the February data. And then if I run all the um, checkpoint stuff again at the end, so I'm not going to save my suite. If I just say I'm running the same thing again, but now it uses, um, oh, sorry, I did the same. I always do that wrong. This is demo effect. Okay, so what I have to do is um, I have to, because I, in the first, um, in the first uh, cell, I actually clear out my my expectation suite. So let's just uh, do this again. Apologies. So I have to, as you can see here, um, I'm creating an uh, expectation suite, and I'm overriding existing one. So I don't want to do that. I just want to get my um, existing expectation suite. And now I have my batch, I'm not doing anything. I only run validation. Let's see if that works. Second time's a charm. Okay, so now I have a bunch of expectations. Again, table level expectations. These are the exact expectations that I created previously. And it tells me that some stuff failed because obviously my values in the passenger count column are very different. So mean must be greater than or equal to 1.57. Well, it's lower because I have a lot of zero values, right? It tells me exactly the same thing. Um, it found the value zero, uh, 1,579 times, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so clearly my data that I ran um, the uh, against the uh, uh, data asset name I should have changed against this file um, just failed the test. Uh, ignore the data asset name. I think I should have specified this somewhere in here manually. Yeah, this one. I, the, the data asset name is really just a, it could be anything. I could have called it like January data, February data. So this is, this was me just not uh, overwriting it. The thing that's actually relevant here is the uh, the file name. Um, and that's it. That's, that's a demo of great expectations. Oh, not quite five minutes, but 10 minutes. Um, uh, 
the other functionality that I have, so in addition to uh, creating the data docs, the data quality report, a lot of our users call it, um, you can, uh, if it runs in your pipeline, you can uh, send up notifications, for example, Slack notifications, Teams, Microsoft Teams, you can send emails, um, pager duty integration, so it can just like fire off a lot of stuff. The thing is, the nice thing is that you don't have to implement it yourself. I, again, if you look at the other tools that I've shown, like they can do the testing, but the like reporting, the notifications and stuff, um, uh, and a lot of the scaffolding, for example, and like the semantic types, for example, um, is sort of unique to Great Expectations. So it's really like a Swiss army knife um, of stuff. Uh, great. Um, so that's it. Um, any more questions? So I know I'm a little over time. Let's see if anyone's still here. Um, we have, oh, 18 people still here. Um, uh, Awesome. Yeah, that's it. Thanks so much. Um, I hope this was uh, interesting. I hope this gave you sort of like an overview of all the fun tools that are out there and the different types of tools and what you can use them for. I hope you've also seen that a lot of the uh, data validation testing tools like work in a very, very similar way, which I thought was kind of fun. It's like, oh, it's the same thing. Like, you know, expect the min and max. Sorry, and I know my, uh, I'm a little bit uh, in the sun. Um, like, here's the min and here's the max, or here's the number of uh, rows and number of columns, right? Like you kind of do very, very similar things. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention with great expectations, it lets you also um, implement custom expectations, just like all the other tools where you can have like a user defined test um, that matches like whatever uh, you need. Um, yeah, slides I will upload to my GitHub. Um, uh, uh, the notebook that I've shown that I've used is also on my GitHub, so I can actually show you uh, the data quality workshop, data quality tools. Um, so this will be, um, I'll just post them in the chat too, but basically uh, I will upload the slides as a PDF and then you can also check out the notebook. Uh, not the fi I will upload the final version in a few minutes. So give it give it five minutes. <laughs> um, cool. That's it. Uh, any other questions? Any comments? Anything? Great. In that case, I'll stop sharing. Hey Sam. And I'll hand over to Rishma. Yeah. Hey, um, just a quick question. Are you close to a window? Can we see out the window with your laptop? Or is it too inconvenient? <laughs> I'm, I'm on. I think your sound is disconnected. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I can see you. I just can't hear you. I feel like something disconnected when you took your laptop off or something. Are your headphones still in the computer? No. Okay. But it's okay. I just want to see. Oh my God. There's Hawaii. Wow. Amazing. That's so cool. <laughs> wow. Yep, Sam is joining us from Hawaii. <laughs> hey there, so I, I still can't hear you. Um, I don't know if something must have happened along the way. Um, but thank you so much. I think you can hear me, right? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna have the video up. Uh, I say, okay, I'm gonna have the video up and I will, you know, let people know. And I will also include a link to your repo in the um, video description. Um, great. All right, uh, no problem. Um, yeah, uh, so for people who are still um, on, um, if you just subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll receive a notification when the video is up and I'll have links to the repo in there and so then if you want to refer to it it will be easy for you to do um thank you so much for joining us okay bye <laughs>